Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Bryant. I'm the Head of Learning Technology and Innovation here at the London School of Economics, and welcome to our inaugural uh, Network Edge set of seminars. These are a set of seminars we're doing around the future and issues around the future of higher education, and they're complement to our now uh, Network Ed seminar, which is in its fourth year this year. So we'll be running about five of these this year, and this is our first, and we're very honoured to have uh, Stephen Downs all the way over from Canada, and as I heard yesterday, uh, that was despite hurricanes in his uh, hometown of Moncton. Uh, so we're very glad that Stephen's here. Uh, Stephen is uh, a person who is currently a researcher for the National Research Council of Canada um, and is quite well known in e-learning circles as one of the people who developed and ran the world's first MOOC. Uh, so it's quite an honour to have Stephen here. Uh, this is, and he'll explain this part of it, but part two of a series of three talks that he's doing this week um, that uh, are looking at a, a number of particular issues uh, for the sector around um, institutions. And today's talk, as you can see on the screen, is entitled Beyond Institutions, Personal Learning in a Networked World. Now, if you want to tweet about this today, please do. If you've got devices, uh, the hashtag is LSE Net Edge. That's LSE Net Edge. Uh, and there are a live stream of this today, and this will also be recorded and available for download as well. But without further ado, I shall hand over to Stephen. Oh. Sorry, I forgot to turn on the audio recording. <laughs> That's how you start a broadcast, with dead air. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, quick mic check, mic check, everything good? All right, I always wanted to do a mic check at the London School of Economics. Uh, thank you very much, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, as Peter said, this is part two of a trilogy of talks. I gave the first one yesterday at uh, University of Greenwich on the topic of open learning and open educational resources. I'll be doing part three on Friday, that'll be focused around assessment and portfolios and personal identity. And this is the one in the middle, which I'm doing here. So if you feel unfulfilled at the end of this talk, it's because it doesn't really have a beginning and it doesn't really have an end. Um, although, you know, like any good producer of sequels, each instance of this series is a self-standing entity. Uh, capable of being enjoyed in its own right. Okay, I'm just kidding, obviously. Uh, talk is called Beyond Institutions, Personal Learning in a Networked World. And I want to begin with the story that came across the, the wires recently and I thought was very appropriate for this venue. And uh, this was a manifesto that was authored by economics students demanding that the way their profession is taught be changed. And they made observations about things like, you know, the global economic collapse and global climate change and other things not really being addressed by current economic theory. And they suggested not so much that current theory is wrong, although current theory is wrong, but that they should be given alternatives or different ways of being able to look at the world. They wanted, in other words, from my perspective, more control over their education. Professors, meanwhile, far from embracing this you know, renaissance of student-led learning, are sticking to the tried and true, tried and true traditional way uh, of lecturing in the classroom to the point where they want laptops banned from the classroom. Dan Rockmore uh, in an article in the uh, Atlantic, as I recall, New Yorker, um, said uh, these digital assistants are more suitable for play and socializing, not getting the point that learning today is more about play and socializing. Uh, it's interesting to the study he cites, there's a little study that says, taking notes by hand creates better memory recall than taking notes by typing. Again, completely missing the whole point of what learning is about. Learning is not remembering. Did I? Sorry, I'm just 
struggling with front key or forward key and back key. Well, in fact, and, and this is well known in, in the, I hope the squeak on the floor doesn't come across in me. <laughs> Can you hear this online? Someone tweet that. <laughs> Yeah, it's the, the creek in the floor should get its own Twitter account. Uh, <laughs> pretty much anything works better than the lecture method uh, that traditional institutions defend. Uh, it's sort of funny we're doing the lecture method here, but actually what we're really doing is uh, we're in the process of creating a learning resource that we hope will be used, shared, cut, clipped, uh, and otherwise abused by people around the world through the years that follow. So this isn't so much about the content of this talk and you remembering what I say uh, as it is about creating the possibility, the potential for dialogue and interaction. Everyone knows that learning is growing at an increasing depth and an increasing breadth. So you need people who can constantly learn and bridge that gap even when they're in their current jobs. This is the shape of learning in the future, not learning where you go to a lecture, you remember the gospel wis wisdom that your professor has told you and you go out in the fourth in the world and propagate it. It's a world where a person is constantly learning before they get to university, while they're in university, after they're at university. And it's a world where the content, the nature, and even the means of learning is changing almost on a daily basis. You know, you look at the setup that we have here, which really would have been practically, not technically, but practically impossible five years ago. Five years from now, it'll be different again. And people are looking for learning that isn't so much the repetition of their professor's ideas, but learning that they can apply that is a part of their life, whether it's part of their life in work, part of their life in their hobbies or their avocations, or part of their life just in what interests them. Uh, they expect universities to be flexible. We were having a conversation um, this morning in the, what was it called, the, the Chancellor's Dining Room? Director's Dining Room. The Director's Dining Room, which, if you haven't been in there, isn't as posh as it sounds, <laughs> although the... <laughs> The walls are very nice. I, lo I love the, the wood panel walls, but little sandwiches and, and you know, egg rolls. Uh, <laughs> um, they, we, were, we were talking about how the university is, is structuring on bachelors, masters, PhD, maybe a couple of other names for these degrees, and that's pretty much it. But that's not what people are looking for in survey after survey. They want learning that is directly and immediately applicable to what they are doing. One of the uh, discussions that came up yesterday, because you know, there's, there's all kinds of surveys about what students want, and uh, you, know, you can go out and cite you know, surveys of students saying, we want the lecture method. Uh, but the discussion centered around the idea, at least my discussion did, around the idea that you can survey students. Students are the people who are already being successful using the current method. And if you're going to survey what people need from education, it's important to survey both those people inside the institutions and those people outside the institutions, particularly those who the institutions did not serve well, those who failed, who dropped out, whatever. Now, economists, on the other hand, have their own view of what academia needs, and we've been hearing a lot about it, uh, both here in Europe as well as in North America. And the economist, that paragon of virtue, that's cynicism. Uh, it, when it says something is good, I really begin to worry. And what it is talking about these days is the destruction of the university at the hands of the massive open online course. As one of the people who invented the massive open online course, I feel a little personally involved here. And it wasn't our intent, I just want to be clear about that now, it was not our intent to destroy universities. That's, that's not why we, we did it. Uh, but we want to change universities 
and we want them to work for the better. And a large part of this talk is about that change. It's interesting. We go from, you know, the first slide about people wanting to be relevant, wanting universities to be relevant, all the way to the last slide about what's going to replace universities without doing all the thinking that we need to do in between. We need to do this thinking in between. So let's begin our thinking with where the current trends we're told, are going. We're told there will be tiered service models at universities. We're told there will be analytics and data-driven management. And we're told there will be alternative credentials. And I think to a certain degree, all of these three things are true. But I think that to a certain degree, none of these three things are going to work themselves out in the way that the economist or economists or education reformers predict. Because when you look at that, basically it's like they have this model or design in their head of how we could rebuild the university system, right? wipe it all out, start over, and we'll have a new model. And the, this model of accountability and cost frameworks and all of that will solve all the problems that the current system has. Models are popular in education, too. Here's a model of a workflow processed, employed to assist LMS selection. You can't really read the small writing there. It goes from enrollment to learner interactions or sorry, enrollment to program administration to learner interactions to content creation to assessment. So it's um, a fishbone diagram. You're probably, if you're in uh, economics or business, you're probably familiar with it. Models of how to select educational technology, including customized lists of LMS features. A way of picking among those 305 features of a learning management system that you might want to solve the educational problems at your institution. Models of how to do learning, learning design patterns. This is Gronje Canol has, has done a lot on this. Diana Lorillard, who I really wish had been there yesterday because I really wanted to have a chance to discuss some of this. Uh, she's been working on, if you get the pedagogy right, That'll solve all the learning problems. Best practices for typical learning tasks. This is a reference to a paper that talks about the, the conditional release of materials. Uh, what we used to call back in the day programmed learning, right? You, you, you do some learning, you do a test. If you pass the test, you get to see the next learning. You still see the old professors with their overhead projectors and their slides and their little piece of paper that they slowly work down the slide because, goodness, you can't have people reading the bottom of the slide first. It would be just wrong. Even models of how to offer courses. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of discussion like this in the literature. Uh, you know, the model of online, hybrid, or traditional models of courses broken down into, into things like uh, the, the types of tools, whether you, you're using discussion boards or whiteboards or websites or videos. And, you know, there's the selection matrix. And out the other end comes, and again, it's kind of hard to read on this, level two, decisions. You have all of these inputs and out pops. It's, it's very much a systems theory kind of approach. You get the, the system, the process right, and everything flows out the bottom the way it should. And these models, these designs are being implemented as educational technology. This is what education reform is about. Well, as I said yesterday, it's also about making a lot of money for some people. But it's about standardizing and rationalizing the educational system to fit into a certain set of models or designs. So we have Google coming out with Classroom, 
just uh, you know, as part of Google Apps. It's Google Apps for teachers. It does all the really useful stuff that teachers need to do, like marking and scheduling and assigning learning tasks and all of that sort of stuff. It's education done by a software application, basically. And it's being commoditized and being standardized and being packaged and delivered. This is education of the future. And, you know, it's interesting. The MOOCs that came out, not the ones that we did, but the ones that came out after us, are, again, very much in that same sort of model. Right? Get some videos, get some exercises, get some tests, step them through it week by week by week. You don't even need a professor. It's nice to have them to do the videos. But otherwise, you just deliver this as a content package. Everybody gets the same thing because that's what works. It's Dan Willingham and, and Paul Kirshner and them say, you know, there, there are no individual differences in how we learn. The way we learn depends on the content, not the learner. And that's a pedagogical approach that I feel is incorrect because I think it is obvious that people learn differently. Learning styles as a theory, and especially as a design theory, may be wrong. But the fact that people learn differently, that they have different objectives, different priorities, different goals, different times that they want to learn, different pets sleeping on their keyboard, all of these impact how people want to learn. And I think that's immediately obvious to anyone who actually looks at people learning. Even as I look around this room, he's on an iPad, she's typing, she's writing on a note, he's asleep. <laughs> Everyone learns differently. This is more from Google. This is the work of education, creating and collecting assignments, making announcements, asking questions, and, of course, a folder, a school folder for each assignment and for each student, which, aside, Google will mine. They've said they will no longer mine student data for commercial purposes. They, they recently came out with that pledge. They did, they did not say they will no longer mine student data. They just said they won't do it for commercial purposes anymore. It's interesting. With models, and it's, again, maybe I'm talking to economists here, maybe I'm not, I'm not sure, but this was actually the subject of my master's thesis, which like maybe three or four people have read. Uh, the model is not the reality. That's, that's my 235-page thesis in one sentence. The model is not the reality. The model has never been the reality. And worse, when you're doing any kind of research, if you use a model, typically the answer to the questions you're researching have been defined by the employment of the model in the first place. And that's what happens here. If we use these models or other models, any kind of model design predetermined structure to define how we're going to understand what learning is, we've predefined what the outcome will be. But learning needs to be open-ended. Learning needs to be an exploration and a discovery, not the output of predefined standardized products. The adaptation of these models to computerized learning is no more effective than the use of these models in the classroom. If your teacher walked in and spoke from a script and answered every question in the same standardized way, we would not consider that effective education. The same is true if it's done on a computer. And, you know, again, we, we're, we're told that these, these MOOCs are a new pedagogy. Uh, we're, we're told that 
the stuff that's being done at Stanford, MIT, edX, the rest of it is, is uh, you know, it's, it's going to change education, but it's a continuation of the same models and the same strategies that have defined education for decades, despite the fact that people are asking for something different. It's not even that the, the new models are the old models with new names. The new models that we're seeing today being done on a computer are the same models we saw being done on a computer a decade ago and two decades ago. Uh, Audrey Waters talks about Fathom. Fathom had a plan, what, they, what their plan was, to take learning materials, put them on a computer, and make them available, even openly, to people who wanted to learn. That was 20 years ago. Well, not quite 20 years, but almost 20 years ago. And people talk about edX and Coursera and the rest of them as being new. It's like they've written out their previous experiences. Interestingly, the president of Coursera um, is the president of Yale who had the wonderful idea of putting courses online and charging money for them. And guess what he's doing or going to do at Coursera? It's the same model being repeated over and over and over again. You know, Universitas 21 was invented something like 15 years ago to monetize online learning. It's one of many initiatives to take a course, charge university-level tuition for it, and sell it online. But it's not what people want, and these initiatives continuously fail. Even LRMI. A learning Resource Metadata Initiative is a system of standardizing the descriptions of learning resources, but it's a clone in many respects. I'll talk about a way in which it's not a clone in, in a number of slides, but it's a clone in many respects of the standards-driven efforts that have come before. AICC, Avi Aviation Industry Computer-Based Training Committee. Uh, they had a set of learning uh, resource uh, metadata standards in the 1990s. IMS, Instructional Management Systems. IEEE, which is the IEEE, Learning Object Metadata. Uh, shareable Courseware Object Recognition Model. Uh, again, over and over and over again, we see you, know, you, you, you take standardized resources, you create standardized descriptions, standardized search mechanisms. The standard is the golden standard of learning, it seems. And it's always as though if we can just get this precise standard right, it'll all work. And the results have been, over the years, pretty much what you expect. Here's Ella. Um, I've forgotten how to... LRMI again, presentation on LRMI. He listed the institutions, there's something like six or seven institutions using LRMI. As with all of these standards initiatives, the easy part, although you'd never know by listening, the easy part is to define the standard. I've designed dozens of standards. The hard part is getting people to use the standard because everybody does these things differently. Even the terms within the standards, you have a term, title, or no, even better, author. Right? You'd think, author, how could you go wrong with author? But you get everything from people, lists of people, organizations, associations, sometimes pets, sometimes <coughs> nothing at all. Uh, and I'm, right now I currently have an issue with my own system because people are putting hypertext markup language inside the author field in their RSS. Why they feel the need to put markup in what should be a simple string of characters, I don't know. But they put anything and everything inside the author tag. New versions of old models don't produce new results. I'd like to go down to Canary Wharf and tack that on one of the buildings. Uh, if you do the same thing, even if you do it on a computer, you're going to get the same result. And the same result, even the people who are producing the results say, isn't sufficient. 
And, you know, I criticize, you know, Coursera, I criticize the Stanford MOOCs and all of that, but when Norvig and Thrun launched their artificial intelligence MOOC, uh, in the first week, 150,000 people signed up. Uh, overall, I think it was something like 250,000 people signed up for one course. A really hard course that's really difficult to understand in artificial intelligence. Forget the fact that a lot of them dropped out. A lot of them didn't. Tens of thousands finished. Right? This by itself indicates that the old model wasn't working. That there was such a pent-up demand for upper-level university courses in artificial intelligence that when one was finally made available, you couldn't, you know, people knocked down the doors trying to get to it. George and I launched our MOOC on connectivism, which some of you may have heard of, most of you may not have heard of. If you talk about a niche subject, this is as niche as it can get. It's an unknown theory in the field of educational technology. Try going out to Fleet Street and advertise that. Hey, there's a, no, nobody's interested. We got 2,200 people without advertising. That's, that was our first MOOC, and that's when we realized we were onto something. Because, again, people were beating down our doors. Not as many people, but they weren't very big doors. You know, and you, you, you see that, you know, offering these courses to 10 or 12 people at a time in a seminar, whether it's online or offline, isn't going to work. Now, here's where I go meta. The right model is no model. The right model is to do away with the models. Think of non-standard based systems. Think of non-standard designs. Think of courses where there are no defined learning objectives. Think of a learning environment where there is no common core of, of content. Think of a conversation where you and I have not first established a shared understanding of the meaning of all of the terms. That's reality. That's this room. Right? There is no model for what's happening here. If there is, I'm probably breaking it. Although I'm probably following, you know, can you come back after the fact, look at what I did and say, oh yeah, that's part of the model. Yeah. But really, you know, the, the slide, because the, the article that I'm referring to referred to Sujata Mitra. Sujata Mitra has almost been commoditized these days. But, but the concept, the idea behind what he did, and also, too, there's been a lot of criticisms because people went back years later to see these computers, and what they found were nothing but holes in the wall. Computers have been vandalized, the plexiglass stolen. Well, that happens. doesn't mean he was wrong. It just means that that experiment for that time was finished. And, you know, people were looking for a model that would always work. But things don't always work. They work for a time, then move on to something else. That's what worked with what Mitra was doing. There were no roles. This is David T. Jones with a cameo by Michael Jackson. What's missing, he says, in the standard-based models is what we used to think of as BAD, B-A-D, bricolage. I remember when IMS Learning Design first came out and they did a tour to promote it. And they used in their documentation and, and in their presentation the metaphor of actors on a stage. And the teacher, of course, would be the director, right? And then everybody would play their roles. And my question was, because I'm from Canada and we, we have these, you probably have these here too, uh, improv. I said, what about improv? Well, you can't do improv. Well, that's what's missing with these models. Affordances. When people built the Internet, they did not intend to design a system that would store, I forget the exact number, I referred to it yesterday, 680 million cat photos. I think that's the number. That was not their purpose. And had anyone 
anticipated in the 1950s and 60s that they were building a system for storing 680 million cat photos. They probably, well, first of all, they would have thought it's ridiculous. And then they would have thought, who would want such a system? But, you know, that's the whole, that's the beauty of the Internet is that although it was used for or designed for academic research and to survive nuclear wars and things like that, it turns out to be the perfect place to share your cat photos. And that's what makes it beautiful. The affordances, the possibilities of technology that come up that you didn't plan on ahead of time that you can use for other things. And, and history is full of these things. From the first person who used duct tape for something other than to repair ducts. You know, the, the misuse of technology is what makes technology great. I wish I could think of more examples off the top of my head because there's dozens and dozens of them, but I can't because I'm in the middle of a talk. But you can, so you should. And then distribution. Uh, the idea that you have to be here to get my wisdom is ridiculous. Um, and what technology, new technology, new learning allows is for this to be not only here, but available online to web video streaming people. Hi, web video streaming people. I would like to make sure the video people know they're important. Um, actually, that's not true. It's something I started yesterday. Uh, but also the audio recording people. Hi, audio recording people who are enjoying a less than perfect experience, but still, you're there. Uh, you know, the, the idea that things don't have to be in one place anymore. We need to question the presumption, and it is a presumption, that there's too much content, too much data. We have information overload. It has to be organized. It has to be standardized. It has to be categorized. It must be delivered in packages. David Weinberger says, we do not, interestingly, feel overloaded by the effects of 1.3 million apple pie recipes, or 7.6 million. He is dramatically underestimated. Says, I searched yesterday. I actually checked. 7.6 million cute cat photos. Maybe he was just referring to the subset of cat photos that is cute, but clearly it's much larger than that. <laughs> right? It's interesting. We're not overwhelmed by it at all. I don't walk down the world worrying, oh, what am I going to do? I get so many cat photos. <laughs> You know, it's ridiculous. But when, you, when we talk about learning, it's almost the first thing people say. We, we started our MOOC. Uh, what we did is we got people to bring in content, got them to suggest content to us. We brought in content. First thing people said was, there's too much content. How am I supposed to remember all of this? Right? And gee, I wish I had had the cat photos line back in 2008, but he didn't say it until 20. 14, so I couldn't, not without time travel. Um, you know, you're not supposed to remember all of it. You know, that's the old way of thinking, that you're supposed to remember the content that the instructor is delivering. Uh, you know, for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which you won't remember it anyways, you're not supposed to remember it. I mean, the whole idea of our course uh, any course, this course, this talk, isn't to get you to remember what I said. So, just so you know, it's okay if you forget every word I've said. It's to stimulate in you the sort of mental experience that will create in you the sort of mental structures that will at some point in the future be useful to you. And it's to stimulate this environment and this sort of interaction. That's why we want questions and discussions after. And that's why we want the real reason people are here, the wine and cheese, I'm assuming cheese, at 4.30. I was told there would be wine. We're not expected to master every one of the 1.3 million apple pie recipes. Mastering one will actually be enough. Mastering three to five will be more than most of us ever do. Actually, mastering one will be more than any of us ever do. 
But the main point is we pick and choose them as we need. And, you know, the interesting thing is take a room full of 50 people and 1.6 million apple pie recipes, people will choose not all the same recipe but different recipes because they look different. They seem different. And they appeal to us in different ways. There's a whole, I have a whole talk on this, how you will read perfect apple pie recipe from Pillsbury.com and that will set off one set of mental associations for you. Someone else will read it very differently. Uh, maybe you have a favorable impression of Pillsbury. Or maybe you think of the Doughboy and say, no, that's not for me. Maybe taste.com.au appeals to the Australian nationalists in the room. Uh, you know, no American would use that one. Just, Australian apple pie isn't as American as apple pie. I know. At a certain point, my talks devolve into nonsense. I'm sorry. It happens. Um, I want to draw a key distinction here. And it's a distinction that the model builders don't get. And it's the distinction between personal learning and personalized learning. It's the difference, same difference as, well, pretty much anything like this, right? Custom car, customized car, right? Um, chocolate, chocolatized. Okay, maybe that metaphor doesn't quite work. But the idea here is that personalized learning personalized anything is you take something that's off the shelf and you tweak some variables to it and that has thereby made it personal. And that's typical and that's what's offered in programmed learning. That's what's offered in you know customized learning solutions, personalized learning, adaptive learning, any of these design based systems, they're personal but really, it's one package with a bunch of options in it. Personal learning is made to order. Personal learning is even learning you make yourself. Personal learning is where you build your learning not from a kit, but from scratch. You see the difference? People don't want customized necessarily. Sometimes they do. But typically they don't. They want personal. They want custom. That's the expensive part of learning. Right? You know, we were talking yesterday about the, the Oxbridge model. The Oxbridge model is so much better, said the uh, vice, assistant vice chancellor. Deputy Vice Chancellor at Greenwich. Why is it so much better? Because he has a point. It is better in many ways. Because it's personal. Probably is really expensive. So it's, it's to provide that for everyone would cost more money than there is in the world. But boy, it sure is nice having learning that's tailored exactly to your needs. But if you can build it yourself, that's better. If you can design your food or choose your food from an infinite array of choices, that's better than going to McDonald's, even if they offer to take the pickle off for you. Institutions, I would argue, understand personalized. They don't get personal. And, you know, there, there's so many ways in which this is manifest. Uh, you know, even in some of the discussions over the last few days about, you know, personal websites by institutional staff. And the first response that comes up is, but will they follow institutional standards? And the answer, of course, is, well, no. Uh, you know, uh, there's the concern about the widespread adoption of social media, right? brings shared interactional process practices that do not match university arrangements for learning. They talk about classes to people who aren't in the class. 
right? That's just wrong, right? You can have a personalized class, but, you know, it's still this thing in a box, but something that's personal can go beyond the box. Autonomy, for many reasons, rather than control, is essential in education. I want to, this is a bit of a digression, but I want to be really clear about what I mean here. Oh, and by the way, I'm a huge Bill Watterson fan. Um, autonomy does not mean no structure. It means choice of structure. Think of touring a city, right? So the way the autonomy versus control thing is typically sketched is uh, if you're visiting a city for the first time, either you wander around with no idea of where anything is or where you are, or you're taken on a guided tour, right? And if you actually want to get someplace in the city, you pretty much have to do the second. You can't do the first because you'll just wander around aimlessly. But that's a dumb distinction, right? Because th those are not the choices that are given to people. If you're visiting a city for the first time, you have a number of choices. You could, and this is, I do this frequently, wander around aimlessly not knowing where you are. Or you could wander aimlessly around with a map. On, on your phone. Or you could wander aimlessly around with a dead battery on your phone, but using maps that are put up in the city. Or you could ask someone for directions. Or you could, as I did this morning, take the train, which will, event, which will drop you close to where you want to go. Although you might have to ask for directions to do that too. Or you could get on one of those hop-on, hop-off buses. Or you could get a friend to drive you around the city and show you things. They offered to do that for me in Greenwich. Or you could join a guided tour. That's choice. That's autonomy. The other option is they kidnap you and take you around to the city no matter where you want to go. That's control. Those are the real choices. Ironically, we do education the second way. But control really is an illusion. Really. You know, it, it's, you know when, when you manage and control and work for outcomes, they tend not to result. Uh, I had another sentence there, but I've forgotten it. Low disk space. Don't tell me that. How can I have low disk space? You silly computer. Okay. So, and this is the interesting thing about these designs. They're really abstractions of the actual process. They're not useful as prescriptions as of what should be done, if they're useful at all, they're useful as descriptions of what was done, but only partial representations of what was done. But the personal, by contrast, is not designed. It's based on, and the, the, the photo of the murmuration should be a big clue here, based on self-organization. It's based on the idea that people can manage themselves and manage their interaction with others, including learning, for themselves. The, the murmuration, they've done studies of the murmuration, and of course there's no head starling. Uh, but what's interesting is there's no mass communication either. Uh, it's rather more like a mesh network in which each starling is reacting only to the seven starlings around it. And any time a starling changes position, the seven starlings around it change position. And that's what produces the cohesive movement of the whole. And it's interesting because when you think of it, and that's not in this article, when you think of it, 
A murmuration is a perceptual system for starlings. It's a way a whole flock of starlings to magnify the perceptions, say, of a hawk by any individual starling. The great wildebeest migration, same sort of thing. They're not actually going somewhere. We think they're going somewhere, but they're not. They're just searching for food and water, and their migration follows the natural patterns of the climate and the environment, and then it takes them around in a big circle over time. You know, it's, it's interesting. This whole concept of design, organization, planning, etc., suggests that we can cause these events to happen. But for anything that's remotely complex, there is no cause, properly so-called, of the event. And Landmark ideas are created not necessarily, well, not at all, pretty much, by individual people, but by societies, by this large murmuration of people interacting with their community. The modern technological world is giving us new examples of that. The hashtag is a way of creating self-organizing networks. Imagine if we tried to plan the Internet so that we could account for and index and abstract all of the conferences that will happen from now on before they happened. It would be ridiculous. Couldn't happen. A new speaker series like this would be impossible to, to anticipate. Hashtag networks can be seen as self-organizing ideas. A hashtag is a murmuration of tweets. That's a neat line. I'll have to remember that. <laughs> Mary Meeker, if you're not familiar with Mary Meeker, you should be, if you're at all interested in education, technology, and markets, has observed the proliferation of apps, not just in education and everywhere. And what the app world does is facilitate this kind of network interaction. And what she's noticing is that the edge, which is jargon speak for the link between two nodes, is more important than the node, where the node is the person, the computer system, the learner, the starling, whatever. It's the connections that are interesting. And that's what's interesting in education as well. The starlings in education are the students, right? The university, the learning institution, properly conceived, should be organized like a murmuration, should be a self-organized assemblage of students. But then, of course, you don't need that institutional structure at all, and it becomes really difficult to justify a $20,000 or 9,000 pound tuition rate. And it's happening. There was a, a critic at yesterday's talk saying, you know, there, there are no students involved in these conferences. But I did a search. Uh, the, the search for student panel actually yielded 199,000 results on Google. The search for EdTech student panel in quotation marks so it's the union set of those words in that exact order yielded 2,000 results. So, you know, the, the students are doing this. They are organizing themselves. Audrey Waters says, and I think she's quite right, the future of educational technology is a reclamation project. The idea here is that we, the learners, the people who need to learn, need to reclaim the management and organization of learning for ourselves. Now, it's interesting. It's like, it's, like, it's like the whole Facebook thing, right? Facebook has taken over conversations with our grandparents, and they're using it to run tests on, on emotions and to sell stuff. We need to reclaim our conversations with our grandparents. We need to reclaim our interactions of Plato, Socrates, and the person next door. We have to reclaim control of the data, the content, and the knowledge we create. The idea that this belongs to the university, that it belongs to the institution, is ridiculous. And the idea that the university has 
any say over what students or even as professors would produce in this internet is absurd. Lucy Gray uh, does what I do. She puts her presentations up on SlideShare. One day SlideShare deleted everything. No explanation, no recourse. No, she couldn't even contact them. She had to tweet it to get any attention from them. No notice, they were just gone. That's why we have to be the owners of our own education. Uh, I read this morning, I didn't have a chance to put it in the uh, slides, there's a guy who started a Coursera course, went two weeks into the course, and then he deleted the entire course. It was, he said, quote, an experiment uh, in causing confusion. Uh, my, uh, one of my colleagues, um, Ben Wordmuller, is creating something called Known. Known is an application where, as he says, you can still share selfies, make friends, listen to music, etc., put up cat photos, very important, but in a space that's yours and that you get to have control over. Ben Wordmuller with uh, Dave Tosh built a thing called Elg a while back, uh, which is now widely respected as a social networking environment for learning. They also built something that really should have been much more successful than it was called Explode, which was uh, a similar sort of thing to Known, except I think Known will be better produced. David Wiley gushed when he heard of the publish on your own site, syndicate elsewhere, anti-model. It's called model in the article, but I'm calling it an anti-model because it's not really a model. And, you know, there, there's been, you know, if you check out the indie web hashtag, you'll see indications of this. Diaspora, disclosure, I invested $100 in it. That was my only investment. Uh, I'll never see a return on it. Um, to AppNet, which I actually pay money to as well, even to syndication itself, it's this idea that what is today a silo, which is learning, is going to become the syndication endpoint. These applications, these services, these resources are the things we reach out and touch, but not where we invest our entire lives. So, Jim Groom has been running something called uh, Reclaim Your Domain. And, you know, there have been various other wordings, reclaim innovation, reclaim learning. Starting now, he writes, a technology that allows for limitless reproduction of knowledge resources, instantaneous global sharing and cooperation, and all the powerful benefits of digital manipulation, recombination, and computation. That was the potential of the Internet 20 years ago. And it was basically stopped by the institutions that decided it should be organized a different way. The idea of reclaim all of this stuff is to bring back that idea of the Internet. But that begins with personal control over your own resources and your own access to external services, including learning. I outlined the model in our discussion earlier today. It's, it used to be the case that you would go to one institution, maybe two institutions, you did all of your learning there. But it's changing now so that you access learning from multiple institutions. Not just multiple universities, but multiple types of institutions. From colleges and universities, uh, potential employers, current employers, past employers, uh, to pet food stores, to friend networks, to special interest groups, to hobby groups, to the government, to whatever. They're all sources of learning. And the idea is you are at the center of this network of learning. Reclaimed learning is network learning. Reclaimed learning is having access to the tools and the mechanisms to freely author and create your own learning and share it with others and to 
access and use learning that was created by others and shared with you. It's your mechanism for talking to the starlings that are nearby. I really love that murmuration example. I'll try not to beat it to death, but does that be beating a starling to <laughs> So that's something like what we were building when we were building the first MOOCs. Our MOOCs are called connectivist MOOCs or C MOOCs. And what makes them distinct is that the people, the individuals are at the center and the learning resources are all distributed. And you might think, well, how do you build a course where the center isn't your course? And what we did is we pointed students to mechanisms on the current internet where they could build one of these. We said, create a blog on Blogger. Create an account on Delicious and do that. Uh, put photos on Flickr, add videos to YouTube, create a Google group, do any of these things. In the future, we'd say, uh, use your own personal web space to organize and coordinate your resources. And then tell us what these resources are. So you create your space, we'll create a space like this too, and then we'll join them together. And that's what we did. So it wasn't a course where we had you know, a pedagogical model in mind where we tried to step people through. It was this ridiculous, no rules kind of mess that turned into a murmuration, that turned into a moot, that turned into something that can attract hundreds of thousands of people. Some of the technology behind the reclaimed web, technology that allows us to have comments on our sites without having to author a comment management system. There's a tool set these days it's called the Distributed Developer Stack, where you can build your own website and then access external services like storage. The old stack was called LAMP, uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Perl. Perl is a programming language. Uh, and so that would be where you manage all your data. Today, the stack is your website, but then all the remote systems that you can access with your website. Making it easier for search engines to index, and this is the promised clarification of LRMI, schema.org, where you manage and create your own metadata. You don't have to adopt and adapt IMS or IEEE or whatever. Schema is being set up by the search engines. The search engines are saying, here's what you can do. It's almost like tagging with tags for websites. Kind of neat. Or this is one called Bitnami. It's an app store for server software. These are all different apps. Again, they're kind of hard to see, but WordPress, Joomla, Redmine, which I don't know anything about, WAMP stack, uh, <laughs> uh, Windows something, 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 uh, probably Python, uh, Moodle, Magneto, Pro just some of them. There's actually 50 or 60 different applications. You want to run a survey. The old way to run a survey on your website is uh, you download and install software like LimeWire, configure it, set it up, hope it works, and launch your survey. Uh, the, the modern way to do it is you get an account uh, with uh, Amazon Web Services or something that will give you some cloud hosting. You use the App Store. Uh, you rent um, LimeWire for $1.99. It installs on Amazon Web Services. You put a link to it. You have a survey running, and you're not even using any, uh, any disk space. And Amazon's taking the hit for all the traffic. Costs you a little money, but it's so much better than Facebook. Take your data back from Google. This will be a thing. A personal web server preloaded with open source software that lets you run all of your web services from home. Your home website. If you don't think it's going to be a thing, think again. People used to go to the Western Union wire office to send messages to each other. Then the fax machine was invented, and Western Union installed a fax machine in each one of their offices. And they figured, 
this is great. Now we can charge people for sending messages, and now they can send facsimile images too. But what happened instead is people bought fax machines and put them in their homes. And you would think, who would put a message sending device in their home? And now we carry them in our pockets. So this is the future of this technology. The, the personal learning that I've been talking about isn't just personal learning in a conceptual sense. It's personal learning in a concrete hardware sense. Your university will be a box in your living room. The modern web is a distributed, interactive murmuration, sorry, of services and people. QR codes, open search, Windows Live tiles, touch icons, RSS, even a thing called humans.txt. All of these are little pieces. Your flavors will all be different, as they should be. The idea that every website must be exactly the same is absurd. Only what, an economist would come up with that. This change is learning. This is what George and I were getting at with the theory of connectivism. Connectivism repositions media as a type of content, but content, remember, is the MacGuffin. It's the thing that gets us talking to each other. We use media, we use our own services, we use our interactions with each other to create links with each other. These links with each other, these connections between people, between neurons, between concepts, between ideas, that's the actual learning. <coughs> I should go on and I have like two hour long talks about that, which I won't do. One question that's always asked is, what is the connection between social networks and neural networks? What is the connection between tweeting each other or sending email or Skyping and learning where learning is the formation of connections between your neurons? Because learning is manifestly the second, what is the, what is the link between the first? And there's two ways of looking at it, and connectivism embraces both ways. These are not alternatives, although they're alternatives, but they're not exclusive alternatives. George's answer is that it's a multimodal extension. What that means is, when you learn, it's literally the formation of connections between your neurons. So you have a network in your brain, but then this network expands out of the brain and into devices, into the Internet, and eventually through to other people. It's, it's, it's an adaptation of the old McLuhan idea that a communication system is like an extension of the body. An information system is an extension of the mind pretty smart. My answer is just as smart. <laughs> my answer is pattern recognition. Um, my answer is that neural networks and, say, social networks are, in fact, ontologically different, and one is not an extension of the other. But they're related. And they're related by, first of all, a common set of underlying principles described in the mathematics and the methodology of networks. And so I talk about underlying network principles like autonomy, diversity, and, and that sort of thing. But the other aspect of it is networks learn by pattern recognition. The learning in a network is literally the formation of connections. A society learns by forming connections between its entities. A human learns its entities, its people, uh, a human learns, sometimes you get a little too abstract. A human learns by forming connections between their neurons. What these connections are actually doing is creating a capacity on the part of the network as a whole to recognize characteristic patterns. Just like a murmuration of starlings can recognize a falcon, not because it has falcon-like content in its collective mind, when you put it that way, it's pretty absurd, right? But because it as a whole is a system that can react to the presence of a falcon. 
I'm assuming falcons predate on starlings. I could be completely wrong, but I assume a murmuration would move away from a falcon. Anyhow, um, I don't know a lot about starlings. But you get the idea, right? So the same principles underlie social networks and personal networks. A social network is a perception mechanism for a society. A neural network is a perception mechanism for a person. Persons can recognize patterns in society. Societies can recognize patterns in persons. And so the interaction begins to flow. You can see that the Downs answer and the Siemens answer are really two sides of the same coin, right? Different ways of seeing the same topic. That's really common in network learning. Even if we're examining the same thing, we're all looking at it from a different perspective. And our understanding of it is never going to be the content of any individual's mind. That, would, again, would be ridiculous. But rather, the combination, the pattern created by the multiple perspectives that come into play as we all look at this common object. If I put a chair in the room, our understanding of the chair is the totality of our perceptions of the chair. Which is why Wittgenstein was right and Moore was wrong. But that's an aside. Connectivism can be thought of as a learning theory. Personally, I don't care whether you call it a theory or not. But, you know, it accounts for existing theories. It explains where we are. And we can make predictions. And one thing I do a lot of is make predictions. The predictions based on connectivism can be tested. I've got a history of making predictions. And I'll continue making predictions. One response of connectivism was the MOOC. We built a course in this network style. What we discovered, and frankly, we did discover this. We did not know this going in this. Building a course as a network allows you to accommodate a lot of people with very few resources. We had a budget for our first MOOC of nothing. And yet we still managed 2,500 people. I shouldn't say nothing. George wrangled the free Illuminate account. So, but, but what, we, what we were doing is we were testing connectivism by using connectivist theory to create a course. And that course resulted in the moot. My verdict is the experiment was a success. Participants seem to agree. Um, you know, creating networks, developing professional uh, connections, studies of MOOCs, and this one is uh, citing a study done by a couple of my colleagues, Helene Fournier and um, Rita Kopp. Uh, you know, the people who actually took these MOOCs report that the really important part wasn't the content, because the content was just the stuff that George and I said, but the creating networks, the developing of connections, the networking, building on the affordances of this particular network. So where are we going? Here comes the prediction part. Although it's not just me anymore. I've been talking about personal learning and personal learning environments for a number of years ago. The Aspen Institute, uh, which is, they're actually kind of one of these right-wing think tanks, but we'll leave that aside. Even they are saying learning has to be personal. Learners have to be empowered to learn any place, any time. The idea is to use networks to support and guide learners, and most importantly, build interoperability across learning networks. Now, grain of salt. They're thinking of this management design perspective. So you can't do exactly what they say, but they have the right idea in saying learning needs to be personal, learning needs to be connected, learning needs to be networked. Learning control is moving beyond computer-assisted programs toward authentic learning contexts mediated by technology. If you think about it, if learning is a network and not an on-site event-based kind of process, it can happen anywhere. And it will happen anywhere. It will happen and be managed and controlled by people using their own devices wherever they happen to be. 
and the devices that are implicated in learning will multiply. Uh, this is an interesting one. I, I love this one. Reading and networking will become one and the same thing. This is not exactly what, what Steve Pettifer is saying, but Steve Pettifer developed a program called Utopia, and it's an Adobe reader, but when you read it, a sidebar opens up and gives you all kinds of resources from other services. We built something similar to that called Plurn. It was an in-house uh, proof of concept project that we did uh, between uh, 2010 and 2012. I've seen similar sorts of things in, in Microsoft Word. The norm will be to have, if you're consuming, terrible word, consuming content, the norm will be that you have a sidebar experience. Even watching television, right? It used to be you sit there, remember that? I know, I'm running out of time and I'm standing there going, that's television. But now we have what they call the second screen experience, right? Reading, watching television, all of these things will be, are becoming networked experiences. In the workplace, connective learning is already changing the workplace. It is going to really change the workplace when our learning becomes present in our devices. I used to talk about the fishing rod that teaches you how to fish. Now, recently I saw an advertisement for a tennis racket that teaches you how to play tennis. Somebody actually built it. It exists. I, I wish I had the link for it. But you, know, you think about do this, do this. You have internal sensors. The internal sensors know what a good swing looks like feeds back to your uh, device, your device says, you know, you really got to work on that backhand, or whatever. Teams and collaborations will be transformed. The old way, the design way, the management way, the control way is to form teams and collaborations and put people in groups and get them all marching to the same tune, singing the same song, etc. The new way is to connect, to interact, but to work autonomously. In software development, they're calling it the oscillation principle, where you get together and connect and go away and do your thing. Get together and connect, go away and do your thing. Cooperation is basically defined as a set of interactions in a problem space. Problem space might be anything. But the idea here is that you can achieve results without actually having all the overhead of a collaboration. A murmuration is cooperation. Each starling is autonomous. Each starling decides for itself where it's going to go. You know, there's no shared vision. Hey, let's have this really neat kind of amorphous mass. Right? It's like one starling saying, that's a falcon, um, and, and making its own decision. In cooperation, we don't share models, we don't share designs, we don't share goals, we don't share objectives. Axelrod talks about cooperation. All cooperation requires is a durable relationship. All the overhead that we typically associate with managing activities on the web, including learning, Things like centrality, commonality, learning objectives, learning management, controlled outcomes, even trust, all of these are unnecessary for self-organizing systems. They're overhead. They, they make the institutions rich. They don't do the kind of job that the students need. Cooperation means working with others, working with them directly without the overhead, doing away with the negotiations, the discussions, the accommodations. All you need is to be able to interact and communicate with people. That doesn't mean you can't you know, have negotiations, discussions, accommodations. A lot of people like that stuff, and it's okay, right? It's like the guided tour. A lot of people like the guided tour, and if you want to get on the guided tour, and share an experience with people, you can. 
But the point of cooperation is we can run a society where you don't have to. The new skills, therefore, both in teaching and learning, are network skills. The new skills, pretty much in any discipline now, are network skills. This is a, a reference to uh, uh, coding for journalists, so that journalists will understand the real meaning of things like lists, loops, and application programming interfaces. The whole idea here is to understand the concepts of how individual entities are related to form patterns, data structures, sorry, data structures and entities. You know, people forget about things like Code Academy, which have proven very successfully through millions of, of users that people can do things like learn to program on their own with, without being told how to do it. It's so like I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. You know, the model for learning is like socializing and playing games. If you've ever been to the media center, I, I visited the media center once, and it was a, at MIT uh, Media Lab. Uh, and it was a really interesting experience because the place is a mess. I'm sorry, it's utter shambles. It's probably a fire trap. Uh, but it's brilliant because people can interact any way they want using whatever kind of device they want. And if you want to build a robot, that's cool. It's all play. But, you know, I'm sure it's not all play. So we have these models. One model is called the super university. And it's going to respond to government directives or, or, or commercial imperatives. It will be designed. It will produce outcomes. It will create jobs, economic development, employment for graduates, even manage immigration, commercialize research. I, I, and this is a line. People, and people tell me this. Uh, it isn't innovation unless it's been commercialized. If you're in, again, if you're in economics or business, you've probably heard this. I really don't think that's true. You might say it's not innovation unless it's used, but that's something distinct. But that's the one model, right? That's, that's the kind of thinking that the peoples that say, you know, there will be ten universities left in the world. Uh, that's the kind of thinking that goes into, into that sort of model, that sort of design. But, you know, they talked about the importance of universities because we need them. They don't talk about what it is, in fact, we need. And, and think about the topics I've talked about in this presentation. Do we need more models and more designs? Does the world really need another theory of learning, honestly? Do we need more standards and more measurements? I showed you half a dozen ways of standardizing learning uh, resources. I could go on about standards and measurements. Do we need more centralization and control? Are the people out there yearning, control me, I don't know where to go? Do we need, quite frankly, the same mistake repeated again? We're able now to rebuild our system of learning. Why on earth would we do it the old way? What is it that we need? What we need is the mechanism to support learning itself. When you ask the people what they want, they don't want immediate economic development. They want better lives. And they see things like learning, like all of those people who, who went to the artificial intelligence course, all of those people who flooded into our MOOC, they're doing the same thing that the people of Leiden did when they opted for a university instead of lower taxes. They're doing what the people of Tübingen did when they said, we want a university, not industrial development. So we have an alternative, right? We do have an alternative. There is a model. It's not a model. Well, I shouldn't call it a model. We have an anti-model. Maybe I should be anti-anti-model and call it, no, never mind, I won't call it. We can 
as they say, reclaim learning. We can have a way of looking at learning where learning is not structured, designed, and set up to create outputs, but rather run, operated, and controlled as an unorganized, unmanaged system by individuals. And so I say we're moving beyond institutions in learning toward a cooperative model, toward a knowing society based on network knowledge. That's the model of the future. And it'll be based on software, technology, resources, systems, interactions, communities, and the rest that take learning well beyond formal education. And people talk about, well, what is the role of formal education and institutions in all of this? It is to serve that. Institutions need to adapt and get out of the mindset that they control and manage learning and now think about how they can serve many different people in many different ways with the resources, the learning, the coaching, the mentoring, etc., that they need when they need it. You know, we're going to get the opposite of these large control-based universities. People say this is the death of the university, these MOOCs, but it's not. This is the beginning of the university, the shift of the university from something big and large and available only to a few to something much smaller, much more nimble, much more independent, a lot like an indie music artist, that line was for George Siemens, that will cater to specific learning needs. And they will number in the hundreds of thousands, not the tens. They will be everywhere. And I thank you for your time and your attention. And we do actually have a little time for questions. But I won't say how little. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that. Um, we do have time for questions. Therefore, uh, the floor is open. We do have a microphone for those of you who do have questions. So that's so that the feed can get you and we can keep you on tape forever. So, uh, who's, I hope floor's open questions. Okay, so reclaiming the web, mm -hmm. okay, reclaiming learning. Um, given that the web's been around for a while, uh, how come the institutions took over? How did that, because why hasn't this happened already if your predictions, because you'd have been making those predictions 25 years ago, right? So what went wrong? Uh, the predictions uh, 20 years ago, for, well, actually 14 years ago. But no, the predictions I made back in 1998, and you can check them, they're online, have come true. So this is new, right? These are the predictions for 2014. It's not that the predictions I made back then were wrong. Back in 1998, I wrote a paper called The Future of Online Learning. I predicted a device that would be widely used by students. It would be about this big by this big. It would cost around $300, and it would be called the pad. But, but I suppose what I mean is, is uh, you know, we're all part of institutions, so we're, we're part of mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah, yeah. Is... is uh, and why, why do institutions come about if what you're yeah. saying is so brilliant? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Hey, look, why was there 2,000 years of history without the Internet before the Internet? Yeah, I don't understand that either. Why didn't they have the Internet back in creation? Uh, I mean, that's the, that's the logical structure of the question, right? But I'll be a bit more charitable. Uh, look. There, if you look at the Internet, and by look at the Internet, I mean look beyond Facebook and look beyond Twitter and look beyond your university intranet, you see exactly what I'm describing. You see a billion web pages, 10 billion web pages. I'm not sure of the exact count. You see tens of thousands of Google groups of people getting together, Google groups, Yahoo groups, other groups, People getting together to talk to each other about things that are important to them. You see 
informal learning like crazy. You see things like the Khan Academy before Microsoft bought it, where some guy just creates a whole bunch of videos. But Microsoft did buy it, though, didn't they? Yeah, they bought, they but bought that. It be the case that they that bought all of that, these but not the consumed. 90 other things. You see, right. you see, you see you're, what you're doing is you're focusing on the big media thing, and you're missing the other 90. So, and, and the reclaim the web thing is ignore the big media thing. It's the other 90 that are important. And there's another thing too, you know, and, and you know, it's hard or has been hard to do things like set up your own web server, right? It's much easier simply to sign on to Facebook. But the technology is being developed. It used to be, you know, really hard to publish a book. And it used to be the only books that ever got published were published by publishers, right? Now anyone can publish a book online. Yeah, there are still publishers, right? And they still exist. And you can say, well, why are there still publishers if anyone can publish a book online? Well, because there's still a business model there, right? People still make money off of it. But that does not negate the fact that anyone who wants can publish online. You see the point? Are you happy with it? It's part of the larger discussion. It's a fair sign to the argument. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good enough. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Also, is that on? Uh, also from my side? It doesn't, it's, it doesn't yes, it's been a live stream. Oh, okay. So sorry. But I okay. just <laughs> Slapped you then. Um, yeah, so I would actually, uh, if I may, um, challenge you on a rather distinct uh, hypothesis, namely that um, people really want to sort of restructure their own learning or do want to, to redefine their learning uh, or define them, their learning in the first place mm -hmm. um, by themselves. Because I have made the experience that a lot of people in general in life are actually quite happy to, you know, have control to a certain degree being taken over them and that they can rely on structures that have established themselves as successful in the past. Mm -hmm. So even though you know, I personally very much agree with you and I'm doing a PhD, so I actually am in that position that I can restructure my learning and I can sit here and not somewhere else, um, I still believe that there's a lot of people who don't want to do that and who actually find it very stressful. So are you not basing, in a way, your, your very argument on a very small... <coughs> I'm going to say elitist group, um, and that this is not very, basically saying that this is not very representative of everybody. This is why I was really careful and even used the analogy, the extended analogy, and I felt badly at the time for going on so long about it, but the analogy of touring a city, right? You're quite right. Uh, you know, even apple pie, right? Most people, well, many people would rather just buy the pie from a store that produces pies. That's kind of where I'm at, right? Um, other people, if they're actually going to make a pie, fools that they are, would rather follow the directions. And then there's this small set of people, this minuscule elite set of people um, who wing it and design an apple pie for themselves by scratch. Right? So the argument is not Everyone wants to design a pie by themselves by scratch. The argument is people want the choice. Right? If the only way in your life you could have apple pie was to go to McDonald's and order an apple pie, you would find that limiting. Right? Even if you like McDonald's apple pie, and it, this, for me, it's the only thing I'll eat at McDonald's the very few times I go in there is the apple pie um, because it's good and it's delicious and it's got this nice hot filling. Um, but you know, if that was the only way to have an apple pie, I would be up in arms and so would everyone else. So you see the difference? Um, and it's a bit, it, it matters, right? Uh, you know, the nice thing about doing a PhD is you're willingly putting yourself under the direction of people who are experts in the field, right? Uh, and it's a powerful experience, and I know you're enjoying it. Um, but if 
that was the only way you could get a job, period. Now, all of a sudden, your willingness to do this takes on a different character. And so that different character is what people are worried about. On that point, I was just reminded of uh, Chomsky's lecture, uh, Education for What and, and, and Why, which was uh, talking about the stratification, political mm -hmm. side of things. And I'm reminded of Zizek's uh, problem solving and, and, and uh, creative thinking or thinking as he makes a distinction. Uh, institutions and the economies depend on people executing the, the sort of, it's almost like serving the, the industrial age, you know, having you to read the manual so you can operate. Psychologists, how mm -hmm. to produce dissent, uh, urban planners, how to organize cities so the dissent doesn't erupt and that cannot be contained. Nobody really wants thinking uh, in, the, in the sort of in the political sense in our institutions anyway. But let's assume that is the case. And you said that uh, perception on a collective level is, uh, is a somehow un, sort of uncorrupted or sort of clean and sort of. Uh, what about you know perception of society? BBC shapes uh, opinions in this country. There's a private use of reason, public use of reason, CNN. Yeah. Right? So our public perceptions are not just a sort of. It's like holding up a cardboard uh, um, hook instead of the sterling, which is not a real hook, but they react in a, in a certain way. So yeah. um, these things are not. As, I, I applaud your idealism. I, I'm, I'm part of it. I had a, a privilege to look at, listen to Richard Stallman about privacy a couple mm -hmm. of uh, just not part from the IET. Savoy, and he was uh, using a MacBook for his publishing time. And so he was, you know, sort of he had to sort of yeah. succumb to the to the all the issues he was uh, passionately against uh, in a, in some ways. We have to obey gravity, I guess. In that sense. So a lot, of, a lot of people say I applaud your idealism, but it could not possibly work. Uh, and and yet, at least in my life, it has worked. So uh, it's it's not a sample set of zero. Um, when you say nobody wants. The people to be educated, the universe of discourse of nobody here is limited to managers and those above managers. Um, you know, I don't think most people have their ambition in life to work in a factory and, and be told what to do. I don't think so. They may choose that, uh, but we have to consider the choices that were offered. And you're quite right. When you, when you point to, uh, you know, the, the influence of media in our thinking, uh, you know, that's, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, it's one of the really interesting consequences of the Internet is that we now have a gazillion, okay, not a gazillion, but at least a billion choices of points of view and perspective. We don't need to depend on the BBC or the Guardian or, or any of the... Uh, Newspapers that have been recently been closed. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? We have many choices. I, I get my news now from a wide variety of sources. So one of the things the, the Internet has done is it's lifted this impact of particular vehicles of ways of looking at the world. And, and this is, I think this is really valuable. I think it's replacing them with others, but at least now it's the choice thing, right? You know, at least now, it used to be if you wanted news, you had to watch BBC or maybe ITV after a certain date. And I understand you have other channels now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but now we, we can get our news from almost anywhere. Uh, literally almost every, anywhere. Where I live in New Brunswick, there's a guy called Charles LeBlanc, who's a self-proclaimed uh, ADHD individual who's been permanently banned from the provincial legislature for various indiscretions, who is one of the major sources of news about political affairs in the province. The guy is crazy, like certifiable, but he's wonderful, and he's just as accurate as the local newspaper. Uh, I've got a question from uh, Sonia Grusendorf. Um, looking forward 200 years, mm -hmm. um, how sustainable is, is the change you're proposing if it's dependent on things like energy and technology? Can self-organization happen without technology? Well, without technology, we'll be depending on self-organization because there will be no means really 
uh, except the club uh, to impose control. Um, and the, uh, the effective limit of a club is the circumference of the arm. Um, okay, that was badly put, but I tried. Uh, what doesn't go away, presumably, is a lot of the technological capacity that we have today. Uh, we know that there are other sources of energy besides fossil fuels. Um, wind, solar, etc. So there's no a priori reason why 200 years from now there would be no energy. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger problem is probably the, the lithium shortage. Um, because it makes portable batteries tricky. But, you know, we'll, we'll have things like carbon nanotube uh, uh, capacitors as a way of having stored portable energy. So I don't think that energy is the big problem two years from now. The fact that many of our major cities are flooded is a big problem. Um, but, but, but energy, I don't think so. So I think in broad strokes, uh, self-organization is sustainable in that way. I think as long as we have the capacity to communicate with each other to any significant degree in a free and open way, self-organization is possible. The bigger threat to self-organization in the future is the reemergence of authoritarianism, uh, uh, you know, non-democratic or post-democratic forms of government, uh, nuclear war, uh, that kind of thing. Those are bigger threats. Uh, corporatism is a bigger threat than the lack of energy, quite frankly, because corporations are not democratic. They're, they're explicitly anti-democratic. Communication within a corporation is very typically monitored and controlled, and that's extending into government, both senses. So those are more concerns. But, you know, interestingly, we're to the point in technology now where we can build alternatives. Uh, what's the name of it? Um, there's an alternative point-to-point -point WiMAX network being set up that operates outside the, uh, the boundaries of the traditional telecom uh, system. Now, it's not very popular, there's no, no particular need for it, but the thing is, the possibility exists with existing knowledge that we can form a mesh network without the existing telecommunications infrastructure. Even things like silicon chips, there are enough silicon chips in the world now that even if we stopped making them, we could go out and mine them from garbage dumps and have a supply for years in the future. It's, it's a m novel I want to write when they're mining for silicon chips. Got to find the knowledge, got to find it from that one. Um, I was intrigued uh, very much by the assertion you've made about uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, don't understand, understand personalization, but don't understand personal. Um, I would like to ask, do you think that through what they understand as personalization, can they get to the personal? Can they reach the personal? And through what way, perhaps? That's a really interesting question. And it's interesting in an ontological sense. If it's true, that we can completely define a person as a set of options where, you know, completely means not fully completely or universally completely, but completely enough, then personalization could take us to personal. But if there are aspects of individuals that cannot be defined a priori as sets of options, then personalization can never become personal. And you see why, right? Personalization requires defining the set of possibilities for 
an individual service or resource by these sets of options. And if this set of options is not complete, at some point, some percentage of people will find a barrier or a limitation. Not that all barriers or limitations are bad, but when they're imposed on you by the structure of the learning or production network, uh, they become something that people struggle against. So, yeah. But, and that's an empirical question, right? That's not a question I, I'm going to say, well, it's you know, conceptually impossible that this could happen or it's practical. It could happen. We could do it. I mean, you know, humans are not infinite. Nothing is infinite. Uh, you know, not even space, probably not even time. Um, so, you know, in, you know, conceptually it's possible, a priori, uh, whether it's practically possible is a matter of just how detailed can our technology get? You know, and, and people who, you know, like um, Neil Stevenson and the Diamond Age with, you know, the, 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 the notebook that reacts to your every learning need. That's the sort of picture that they have in mind where, you know, the, the notebook learns enough facts about you and throws enough switches that it becomes completely personal. And maybe we could design a system that's sufficiently complex. But, you know, if I, if, if I had to pick one, I'd say probably not. I'd say Maybe it could be done, but it would probably be too expensive. It would cost as much as a professor, and it would require more money than there is in the world to provide one for everyone. So, yeah, I, I think personal is the way to go. Well, that's uh, taken us perfectly to uh, wine and cheese time, uh, which, of course, is always good. Um, I'd like to thank Stephen once again for his very thought-provoking and uh, engaging discussion. And if you are going to the EPIC conference, either on the live stream or from people here, part three will be on Friday. It'll but be we'll also be available. Be and, we'll be ava <laughs> and we'll be available on Stephen's website as well. Um, just a small advertisement for things uh, coming up as part of our network ed session. We are obviously in recess over summer, but our next one will be the 22nd of October with Josie Fraser. Uh, from Leicester City Council, uh, who, uh, doing advice, who does advice on digital literacies in schools. On the 5th of November, in fact, Stephen had a slide uh, referencing her, Helen Keegan uh, from the uh, University of Salford, who is doing some amazing work around students as producers. And we've also got one on the 26th of November with Marika Guy from the Open Knowledge Foundation. So we've got some really interesting speakers coming up, and our next Network Edge will be uh, at the moment planned for November. So once again, if you could give Stephen a round of applause and thank him for his time, there will be wine. Thank you.